All right. Hello, hello. Get you guys together on this nice day. Uh, so now that we are fully in the Cenozoic, we're getting into some, I think, like really, really fun stuff. This is one of my favorite lectures. Um, a lot of the building blocks to understand the biodiversity that we have on our planet right now and why things are the way that they are in different places on our planet. I think you guys saw a little bit on Tuesday. Biogeography explains a lot of it, kind of what the distribution of organisms was across the different continents at the start of our era, and then how they all evolved. And so today we're going to be focused on like these land masses, very different sizes for many tens of millions of years, and how they each are doing different things. And so real quick, how I wanted to start off this class, this is a picture of South America, maybe like 18 million years ago or so. Interesting things, I hope, to you. <laughs> it don't look like South America should look. Um, talk to your neighbors for a quick second, though. You're all uh, relatively advanced biology students. What's the deal with islands when it comes to biology? What do you think of when you think of islands and evolution in biology? Go ahead and talk to each other, please. Okay, I'm hearing like a lot of really good stuff. So let me just start hearing some of the things you guys are talking about. Just anything that has to do with islands and biology. Big things get smaller, small things get bigger. Body size weirdness. <laughs> I heard somebody else say the word weird. That's always a comparative term, right? That's not an objective, absolute measure of anything. Islands exist in our minds, like off on the side of mainlands where normal things happen, which is of course not a very fair way of looking at it at all. But on islands, things can get different. A really excellent example that's really well known, especially on pretty small islands, is body size. Larger animals getting pretty small, small animals being relatively huge, that's something we definitely see on islands, usually small islands. I also want you guys, well, let me get some more ideas before I say anything else. High endemicism, low biodiversity. Relatively, lower biodiversity, potentially. And high endemism. So things that live there and live nowhere else tends to be higher, especially for, of course, we're talking about terrestrial organisms on terrestrial islands. You guys can also think of islands as like an idea in quotes, right? There's geographic islands, islands meaning that kind of isolated place. I heard people talking about gene pools and stuff. What was that about? There's no gene flow. Yeah. No gene flow. So what does that mean? No new alleles coming into the population. No new alleles. So again, uh, so, um, Related to what we talked about just a second ago with high endemism, lack of gene flow. One of the things that's like a corollary to getting weird is like when you're alone, there might not be like some stabilizing selection from some other larger population. So when things get fixed, you can get very interesting, different morphologies. Any other ideas? Founder effect. Founder effect? That's the genotype that arrives. And of course, the corresponding phenotype of like maybe an immigrant that does make it to an island has a huge effect on the subsequent evolution. These are all great ideas. When you think about biology and you think about evolution, you are usually thinking about things like this. And these are usually related pretty strongly with like Hawaii sized islands, Galapagos sized islands, individual Indonesian sized islands. How do you guys think about islands when it comes to like continent sized islands? An island as big as Africa. An island as big as Australia, which probably isn't that hard to imagine. An island as big as South America. So talk to each other again. What is it happens on those continent scale islands? It's like 
All right, so what about what about island like confidence? What's like what would you add to these lists? Ideas. Yeah, Gary. You were not talking about how lineages fill niches and we don't see them filling in other parts of the world. You mean like the same lineages in two places, but yeah. it's doing something so different like, in one place versus the other? Is yeah, you know, like uh Komodo dragon being apex predator and something okay. like that. terror birds doing terror bird things. These are terror birds, uh, by the way. <laughs> that one, that one over there. <laughs> New Zealand is an example of birds filling the niche. Oh, yeah, I'm going to put New Zealand with Madagascar kind of in between these because they're pretty big. Yeah. Okay, so like lineages filling different niche space on different islands. What else? Or different land masses we could take. What else? Like a relic species of fossils. Oh, so say more. Uh, like, like maybe even whole branches of tree of life that are found there, but they aren't found like anywhere else in the world because they got like wiped out by platypuses. Anybody, <laughs> echidnas, right? So, animals that are restricted to certain places now, and maybe the geography of that place, the isolation of that place is one of the factors that contribute to a clade that's like relatively ancient, something like this, maybe something like the Tuatara in New Zealand. That's definitely possible. You don't have as many. You don't have as many clays out from elsewhere arriving on other islands. Plus, maybe they fly. So, not much, uh, like not not much like clay level migration in kind of like a larger scale. So what? So okay. So I agree with that. I agree with that. So uh, not as much migration in. So uh, fewer clades maybe uh, in terms of like big groups of organisms that taxonomically can put into a clade. Then what's happening within those groups on an island? Within them, you tend to get lots of uh, ecological diversification. Yes. Similar to what Gary said, where we have different animals, like the same animal lineages on two of these land masses, maybe it's doing something different on each one. Another thing you can think of is like a single origination, an adaptive radiation on one of these continents, and then the subsequent species filling up all kinds of niche space. And maybe they're much more restricted on other land masses. And so adaptive radiations are, of course, a big thing in biology. They all have a sense of scale. Finches in the Galapagos, actually finches also in Hawaii, can radiate, have very different beak shapes. But they're still just all like sister species. You can think of like marsupials in Australia as like a four ordinal level adaptive radiation that's humongous. So there's a scale here. These are all great ideas. Thank you guys for putting on your biology hardcore hats for a second to like help us preface these things. I love this lecture so much because as I hope I've made very quite clear to you, I'm like a pretty huge biodiversity super fan. And so I just like blasting through so much of what happened in South America, in Africa, in Australia, in the Paleogene, and in the period that comes after it, which is called the Neogene, and just really showing it all to you guys. Uh, if we learned everything about every organism, it would take all semester. But in this one lecture, we'll try to just be like, look at this, look at this. I think it should be fun. All right, thank you. Um, so we talked about climate. Climate's one of these big things that's going alongside patterns in biogeography. It affects things. We talked about the Paleogene on Tuesday. And we talked about what the Paleogene means, what happens in it. We're going to, of course, be in the Paleogene for quite a while today. This is a flowering plant dominated world, a very, very, very warm world, generally wet world. A couple times when it's extremely hot, maybe the hottest it's ever been, potentially. A lot of the ordinal level appearances of today's big groups of vertebrates in the oceans, meaning fishes, and then, of course, with like birds and mammals, are all happening in the Paleogene. But now I want to talk about the next period, because I want to talk about both when I talk about Australia or when I talk about Africa, and that's the Neogene period. So here's a map of the Neogene. The Neogene goes from 23 million to two and a half million, so real close to now. 
This is the neogene period. Two little pieces of ins inside of it, the Miocene and the Pliocene. Here's a nice map of the world from like relatively like far into the Miocene. And you guys have already seen this curve. This curve is that deep benthic oxygen curve that serves as a temperature for, or sorry, a proxy for Earth's temperature, the deep oceans thermometer. And so talk to your neighbors for a minute. Tell me about climate from 23 million years ago. Remember, we dropped at the end of the Paleogene the last 10 million years or so because the Antarctica got isolated. So we had a bit of a step change in climate back in the Paleogene that went for a while. Now we're here. We're going all the way to the Pliocene, which is there. Don't worry about anything before or after the Neogene, please. Talk to your neighbors, and what are you noticing? Yeah, the different shapes. Yeah. yeah. It looks like it takes some time. Yeah. It's like you have yeah, and then all the noticeable bubbles for the where the blood was also being put in. Absolutely, Columbia. Yeah, so if you look at the underneath the curve line with the little black bar. Oh yeah, I see. That's not strong. It's not the work we get. And it seems to be a corresponding climate change. Which one? I would say it's. I don't think it affects the um, subsequent generations. I don't know for sure. I am not an expert by any means of the response. No, but it's interesting because the actual actually the increase has all right, can you guys tell me anything you're seeing within this yellow box in the Neogene? That seems interesting or important. <laughs> We talked a bit about a little bump right above the like, blood basalt replacement. So it looks like there's some corresponding climate change. So we see like this relatively steady temperature, I think pretty, pretty amazingly steady temperature from about 34 million to the Ligocene end of the Paleogene, all the way through most of the Miocene, but or sorry, sorry, the beginning of the Miocene. And then there's this optimum, a relative heightening of temperatures or raising of temperatures. To be clear over here, this temperature scale is relative to our like pre-industrial or early industrial baseline. So this is all like negative four or four above or below our current average. We'll talk about that much, much later. But a little bump right here. And this bump's really interesting because it's associated with another flood basalt, a large igneous province. And it's the one that we have here in Idaho. You guys drive to Seattle or drive to Portland, you're going to go past Boise, and there's just black lava on either side of the road forever in all directions in eastern Washington, eastern Oregon, and western Idaho. That's the Columbia River flood basalt. That's the last time in Earth history that we've had one of these. That's on the map in that mass extinction paper we have read. So next time you guys want to drive over there, you can see these things. And we do see a little bit of a bump, we think, in temperature that's associated with that. But OK, what else? I think it looks pretty stable, I mean, relatively. Pretty stable, a little bump, and kind of a drop down right here relative to there, right? This and this are different lines, but they're not crazy, crazy different. If you guys look up top, I know it's hard to see. We see the like full on glaciation of West Antarctica and then the beginning of the glaciation of the Northern Hemisphere, not very extreme, but starting to see permanent ice up in the Northern Hemisphere in different places. So as this temperature cools down, we start to get more ice on the planet. Not as extreme as it's gonna get, but it starts to show up. Okay, that is some like little bit of a baseline. Cooler in general, absolutely, than the Paleogene. Obviously much warmer than today, for the most part. Cool. So here's other things happening in the Neogene. We're in a cooler state. Um, Antarctica gets fully glaciated. It's only in the Neogene that one of these island continents finally connects up with the northern landmasses. Africa does it first. Arabia, the Arabian Peninsula, is part of the African continent, although it is drifting away right now. 
And so the Arabian area, what's now the Middle East, is the first point of like really strong connection between Africa and Eurasia. And of course, Eurasia is almost always communicating with North America. So Africa is the first of these island continents to join up, and that happens pretty early in the Neogene. South America and North America made contact in the Neogene as well, starting about 7 million years ago. We'll talk about that a little bit today. Uh, in the seas, most of the major marine mammal groups show up in the Neogene. So the ones that don't show up in the Paleogene are things like um, seals and walruses and otters and things like that. What I think is really cool is the Neogene has the largest kept or, uh, oceanic vertebrate predators of all time. It's not during the age of dinosaurs that you have the most massive, scary monsters in the ocean. It's during the Neogene that you have some of these gigantic whales related to sperm whales and gigantic sharks related to the great white shark like this one, which is Megalodon. I'm sure you guys have heard of the Meg. The Meg is not a dinosaur shark. It is a Neogene shark, and that's pretty cool. Out on land, the big story that goes hand in hand with that uh, cooling is a drying out also of the climate generally in many places around the globe, especially in those belts north and south of the equator. The equator usually stays pretty wet itself. And so what also happens in conjunction with that is the spread of this grassland ecosystem. Grasslands are fully novel as ecosystems in the Neogene. Very, very hardy flowering plants. Grasses are a kind of flowering plant. And then of course you guys know there's tons and tons and tons of like wildflowers and like bushy type of things that are all associated with grasslands. These evolve on one continent. We'll talk about which one later and then spread all over the world. And we see all over the world independently, many, many different groups of vertebrates. I put here snakes, lizards, songbirds, rodents, hooked animals evolving to adapt to these grasslands. But so whenever you see a drawing of like dinosaurs, they should never be out on like a savanna. It's always ferns and things like that. Grasslands don't show up until the Neogene. That's very cool. And then the other story of the Neogene is the things like Africa connecting to Eurasia, South America connecting to North America, and an increasing homogenization of the terrestrial vertebrate fauna of the world. Relative to the Paleogene, the beginning of the Neogene, a lot of these land masses are very different from each other. Here's our little look at um, the placental mammal diversity to remind you guys of these big picture divisions that DNA has helped us elucidate amongst the placental mammals. So a South African clade, clade the Xenarthrins, an African clade, the Aphrotheres, and then this gigantic clade here with two big clumps spread across Eurasia and North America cumulatively with all those animals in it. And so you saw this map on Tuesday, weird marsupials in South America, Antarctica and Australia in the Paleogene, monotremes in Australia and South America in the Paleogene, and then the placentals on these different land masses. And so a lot of that is a factor of chance. This is where these animals are. They're very shrewy, mousy, possumy looking ancestors when the asteroid hits. And then they all evolve and adapt to become big mammals. And so they do it in different ways. But one of the things that was mentioned here are these adaptive radiations on continents. What is so cool is how many times different lineages of mammals basically evolve the exact same thing. An example I won't talk about today is like anteaters. Anteaters live in Australia, but pangolins evolve in Asia, and they got claws and a mouth with a long tongue in it. Aardvarks have claws and a mouth with a long tongue in it. There's convergent evolution of the same types of mammals, but they're not related to each other, and that's a factor of geography. That's really, really cool. So let's talk a little bit about the birds that we left off with. Same thing as mammals. Birds, different than mammals, can fly. So for them, geography isn't too restrictive. A lot of them cross, cross oceans pretty easily. Uh, but there's a really fun clade, and I've got a lot of good biological history here. This clade of birds is called the Paleognaths, represented by the ostrich today. I want to talk a little more about these island continents. So you guys probably know there's all these weird flightless birds down south on this planet. South America has these birds called rayas. Africa has these birds called ostriches. Australia's got cassowaries and emus. And then New Zealand, which, sorry, is over here, back in the Paleogene, has a kiwi on it. And so biologists for a long time wondered about these birds that can't fly, some of which don't even have wings at all. What is a pattern, or what are some patterns, or some hypotheses that could explain the distribution of these flightless birds? Talk to each other, please. Related. They are related. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, so what's 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 there's several of course possible things we can think of. What's one idea that could explain this distribution? When Gondwana was a thing, when these all went together, that's when that bird's common ancestor lived. If you guys get a biology textbook from many of the last several decades, you're going to get people who are arguing just that. These birds were thought to be a really excellent argument for continental drift and the breakup of the continents, and now everyone has its own flightless bird lineage. But guess what? That's fallen apart because now we have molecular phylogeny. We know that these birds all diversified very recently, something like 40, 50 million years of time ago. And the geologists can tell us that these continents broke apart starting in the Jurassic, 180 million years ago, 100 million years ago, 80 million years ago, these different breaks. So the timing of their breakup and the timing of those birds' evolution <clears throat> doesn't line up. So they can't be, they were all on Gondwana and now they're all isolated. So what other things might we look for to figure this out or get a satisfying answer? There's lots of things we could wonder. Uh, talk to your neighbors. Well, at least it's not a all right, well, what are some things we can look for to help us out? We found a flighted ancestor of each of these on their oh. fossil. Oh, Wouldn't that be fun? A flying ostrich? Okay, what else? Anything else that might help us? This one I wondered. So, of course, there's a couple different things. One thing is this other bird, which you guys might not know anything about, and that's fine. These birds are called tinamous. They live in South America. There's many species of tinamous. Tinamous absolutely have their wings and absolutely can fly. And everybody's known for a long time that they're in this family this group, this uh, clade of flightless birds. And so for a long time, all the ornithologists were like, well, they must be sister to all the ones that can't fly. Now we have DNA evidence that shows that they're actually way up in there as one member in the middle of this diversity that still has its wings and still flies. So that makes the pattern of flight loss very complicated. And then like you guys suppose, we could of course look for fossils. And there's actually several fossils now of different lineages of these early paleognath birds that we know were flighted early paleognath. And so it actually seems quite clear now that several times lineages of paleognath, paleognath birds only on the island continents, not up here, on these separate land masses, clearly evolved flightlessness. And so flightless birds on islands is something that happens again and again and again and again and again. Obviously, Africa and South America are quite huge, and I don't even like calling them islands. They're whole continents, but it's a pattern we see. I think this is really fun. You guys are going to hear more about flightless birds as we keep going through this lecture and next week and from Chrissy. And so there's going to be plenty of no flying birds in your future if you have questions. This, though, is just one of my favorite beautiful examples of scientists like working their way through a problem that seems very difficult and being like, oh, OK. OK, so throughout the Cenozoic, there's easy exchange of land living organisms when continents touch. However, Always in Earth history, there are examples of organisms that are terrestrial being on multiple continents that definitely do not touch. They have to disperse. And so I'm curious, what are some ways dispersal might happen? And what kinds of animals or what features of those animals might make animals more likely to disperse than others? OK, talk to each other, please, about that. What was this? the winner. What else? Yeah. Well, I think it's right now. So, so once you get to that shell, it's hot. Right, it's all the ocean. Right, you used to be hit with it. You used to be hit with it. You used to be hit with it. 
Okay, so what are some ways terrestrial organisms could disperse across oceans? Yes. Hurricanes, say more, please. <laughs> Sharknado? What are you talking about? Yeah. Well, they can like gather birds of station and move it. And move actually, it. Do you mean like literally like on the crest of the wind? Inside the eye. Oh my God. Okay, interesting. So storms, weather systems, good. What else? Swimming. Mass wasting. Swimming. What? Mass wasting of what they created, rafts. Rafts. Who's heard of rafting? Rafting is a really fantastic thing. Rafting is the idea that you'd have these, and they have been observed in the modern world in big river systems, these mats of vegetation, these logs, which can very often be distributed after storms. And you have huge amounts of vegetation that maybe drifts out in the ocean. You have to think of all the hundreds of them that just end up sinking and don't go anywhere. But occasionally some washing up on an island. That's how most of the islands in the world get populated in the first place with terrestrial organisms. So of course it can happen between continents. These are interesting things because they are very rare to expect at any given moment or with any given storm. But when you have millions of years, it almost becomes an inevitability. That you're gonna have some transfer between continents that are close enough and if the currents line up in a certain way to make the dispersal happen. So what kinds of animals, you know, you talk about like a stranded animal that washes up here or washes up here. That doesn't mean now the new clade lives on this continent. That individual might be by itself. You need like a population of them, or you need it to happen quickly enough that they can reproduce and establish themselves on that new landmass, let alone any biological competition they might be facing once they start to reproduce in that place. So it's really interesting to think of all the ways we'll never know about which animals made crossings and then it just didn't work out. Does that make sense? Animals that raft are pretty likely to be small animals and it's a super common way for a lot of reptiles to move around because they have like low metabolic requirements. So they're just hanging on to some floating palm tree for three weeks and they're fine. Mammals disperse for sure, but most of the mammals we think did transoceanic dispersals are smaller organisms, which makes sense from the population level. A herd of elephants washing up, no, right? You guys know a ship goes down and people wash up all over the place. But if you have a little tight cluster, you can maybe get six monkeys or five rats, and maybe that's enough. These are very interesting ideas to think about, and I wanted to just introduce it before we got too far into the real paleo stuff. Okay, so I wanna talk about these actual continents. Um, I'm gonna skip that one just for time's sake, because I think this is just like so much fun. And what I really would want to encourage you guys to do is think about what these land masses must have been like, getting out of your time machine, walking around with your binoculars or whatever, uh, these are the only organisms vertebrate wise that we know about running around there. So here's the paleogene. Each time I do one of these continents, I'm gonna show you the two maps, the one that's grayed out, we're not talking about right now. I put them with the latitude and longitude correct. So you can actually see how Africa moved through time. And we'll do that for all of them. So Africa's been going north, it's still slamming up into Europe, making those Alps and Caucasus and everything else. So here's Africa and the paleogene. You guys know a bunch of these Afrotherian clades, Hyraxes, Tenrex, Aardvarks, this one paleognath bird clade, ostriches, they're all endemic to Africa. Okay, very cool. What else is in Africa in the paleogene when we look through the fossil record? There's this wonderful animal called he's a siren. I'd encourage you to do a quick chat with your neighbors. What do you think this is? Quick chat with your neighbors, quiet voices. All right, any 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 non grad student takes on what this might be? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I think it's a manatee. Why do you think it's a manatee? Because it's Sirenian. Yeah, they're all Sirenians. And so this is one of the best known fossils of really early members of the Sirenian lineage. So of course, that's a manatee with its legs still walking around on land. 
Very fun to imagine. Manatees today, of course, have no hind limbs whatsoever, and their forelimbs are adapted into flippers. But if you ever go to an aquarium or you go swimming with them in Florida or something, check their flippers. They've got big hooks at the end of those flippers. So these are Afrotherian mammals. Their teeth are very similar to the teeth of hyraxes. So there's a piece of siren, a terrestrial herbivore, not a oceanic swimming herbivore. Uh, what about Moritherium? What does Moritherium look like to you guys? I, I think it looks a lot like a piece of siren, like that. They look like each other. Got bigger teeth. This is another little fat waddler <laughs> eating plants. A lot like Peas of Siren, which I think is beautiful and lovely. Any wild guesses at all? Here's a nice little picture for you. <laughs> Remember, do your best to think of like, rewind both of these like 10 million years or so back to the immediate aftermath of the asteroid and everything's just this tiny generalized looking man. So they're starting to get weird. They're starting to go into these niche spaces. So this is our manatee. And this is our one of the absolute best known early elephant relatives. So more Ethereum is part of this group Proboscidea. Um, it's not in the crown group, of course, proboscideans. But so here's a really early manatee, and here's a really early elephant. And so you can see why even the people that do fossils and anatomy were like, I bet they're related, before the DNA was like, oh, for sure, they're related. <laughs> they certainly don't look like that today. If you imagine a manatee and an elephant, but that's today. Uh, here's another paleogene elephant that's a little more maybe palatable to you, Pheomia. Pheomia is maybe different than you expect. Big tusks up in the front, oh, sorry, the top jaw coming down here, nice molars in the back, but a very big, long, scoopy jaw with actually tusks on the lower jaw that are like a shovel shape sticking forward in the front. So there's Pheomia, what a delight. Our first example of like trunks evolving amongst placental mammals. Don't worry, it'll happen too many more times. But what else is going on in the Paleogene of Africa? Uh, other weirdos that are related. This is a lineage of Afrotherian mammal that is no longer alive at all, has no living relatives. What do you think it looks like? It certainly looks kind of like a rhino, doesn't it? Except unlike a rhino, which has a horn made of keratin, this is the bones of the skull of this giant animal called Arsinotherium. That's the bones of the skull with some sort of covering on it. So Arsinotherium is pretty wild. I have to imagine those are sexually selected, but I can't really tell you that. This is another animal that is related to elephants and manatees, but again, no living relatives. So think about that endemicity, things that are happening on these islands. One of the coolest things, and we'll talk about this in Tuesday on detail, is most of our really, really excellent fully swimming whale fossil record technically comes from Africa. Those animals evolved in Asia. We're gonna talk about that. But places like Egypt today, Algeria today, uh, have these fossils of really early whales. So you can imagine Paleogene Africa got happening at least up on that north coast, which is pretty cool. And then we actually have a bunch of these dispersers. These are organisms we're almost certain in every way came across from Europe and Asia, Eurasian immigrants. Creodonts are a kind of carnivorous mammal relatives, the order carnivora today, that's cats and dogs and bears and stuff. These are not in that order, but they're thought to be very close relatives. A lot of the carnivores in Paleogene Africa are these creodonts, which are immigrants. There are also a rodent irradiation in Africa and a primate radiation in Africa. This fossil's from Egypt, and there's histricomorph rodents all over Africa. If you guys ever see a phylogeny of rodentia today, there's a whole clade that very obviously has an African origination point. Rodents, primates, carnivores came in across the ocean and then adapted here during this time. These animals, we think, were there from the beginning of their evolution. So slightly different, but it's still all Paleogene Africa. Okay, I'll give you a second. Look at the slide. Imagine getting out of your time machine, having a picnic. I think it sounds great. That's Africa Paleogene. So what's the story with Africa in the Neogene? So now we're like in the 23 to 5 million year range. Manatees, of course, go full oceanic. 
If you guys look at manatees today, there's African ones and then South American ones. They just cross the Atlantic and up into, of course, Florida. So manatees lose their back legs, go on full flipper mode, although they have very nice hands, and become pan-tropically distributed. Dugongs today are way over in like Indonesia. Elephants are the really fun story. And elephants are big animals, like dinosaurs were big animals. So we have a really, really good elephant fossil record because their bones make fossils easily. I just want to show you a bunch of fantastic elephant lineages. These are whole lineages. Most of them have many, many species. There are dinotheres. So you saw some of these, I think, from Weston and maybe somebody else on Monday. But dinotheres are huge. These are some of the largest elephants of all time. They do not have tusks in their upper jaw. They probably have very short trunks. But they do have these like recurved lower jaw tusks that come down. And again, the tusks of almost all elephants are the incisor teeth. They're not the canine teeth. So those are long, long, long incisors sticking out of the chin. Aside from dinotheres, there's gomphotheres. Gomphotheres have really long tusks above and below, upper jaws and lower jaws. Gomphotheres are one of these clades that actually, when they leave Africa, go everywhere. Some of the best gomphotheer fossils in the world are from Nebraska. And we'll talk about that <laughs> later. But they evolved in Africa during the Neogene. Mastodons, I'm sure you guys have heard of. I think in your mind, that probably is an elephant. I will tell you, it totally isn't. But I know it does look a lot like elephants with the trunk and the tusks and everything like that. And then there are the true elephants, which includes, of course, things like the elephants you guys know. It includes things that will evolve later, like mammoths, which are not in the Neogene. And then other awesome things that are called stegodons that also have gigantic tusks both top and bottom. So you can see elephant evolution is kind of all variations on a very cool theme. Today there are only three species left and they're all just in one of the groups, which is kind of a bummer to me. But this is an endemic African radiation. The other thing I would add about endemic African stuff in the Neogene are some of those creodonts. As far as we can tell, the heaviest, largest mammalian terrestrial predator of all time, like today it's a polar bear and then like a bangy tiger maybe, is one of these creodonts from the African radiation of creodonts. It has an absolutely five-star name, Simba Kubwa, and it has this huge, huge, huge lower jaw full of teeth, and there's how big Simba Kubwa was. So we talk about endemic African stuff going on in the Neogene. It's a lot of cool elephants. There's, of course, rodents and stuff I'm not showing you. And then I think it's worth you guys knowing that one of the biggest mammal carnivores of all time, and probably the biggest one, is an African endemic creodon. Not a carnivore, but really close to them. And it's really got a scary jaw. This is a lion jaw from Kenya, and then this is Simba Kabwa, which is also from Kenya. So just to give you a sense of, <laughs> sense of scale. But OK, important, important, important is that we know from geology that Africa is the first of these island continents to communicate with the North America Eurasia supercontinent, the quote unquote mainland of the Cenozoic. And so interesting things happen. When you guys think of Africa, I'm sure you think of a few kinds of animal, but most of them are neogene immigrants into Africa. And so it's very interesting to wonder what were the selective factors that let some African animals spread out and be extremely successful, some spread out with limited success, some to never leave Africa. And then what features made these animals and from North America successful when they went into Africa and potentially maybe outcompete the endemic stuff that is already in Africa. These are long standing biological questions. To be clear to you guys, dugongs go into the water, which I'm not paying attention to right now. But when it comes to the other African endemics, elephants leave with awesome power and end up everywhere. <laughs> And then hyraxes, these little relatives of elephants, they leave too. They're in like the Middle East still. That's kind of that way's arrow. The other way arrow, when connection is made and animals go into Africa, is hilariously more so. These are the animals we'll talk about next week. But your odd hoofed ungulates, your even hoofed ungulates, your carnivores, your other carnivores, your hippos, your primates like apes, your bunnies, your more rodents, your pigs, your pangolins, these are all Eurasian North American evolutions that when the connection is made, go into Africa and are of course extremely successful. These lineages are what went into Africa 17 million years ago, 16 million years ago, 19 million years ago, different timing. Obviously these are pictures of living species, so it's not a gorilla and a giraffe that walk into Africa. It's an early ape and an early giraffe relative. But this is the point I want you guys to make. When island continents connect with our mainland, and now Africa, I like to think of it as, joins the hegemony, and elephants become a standard, 
and these kind of mix up, it always is that pattern. The smaller landmass meets up and there's two arrows, but one's always way bigger than the other one in hindsight. That's really interesting. And so there's a timing here that we can manage. Those creodonts go away and you get a lot of carnivores. We don't know if it's direct competition or what's going on. These animals come in, these animals go out. It is two-way, but it's not balanced. The other thing that's cool about Neogene Africa that we'll get to later is that it's where we come from. All of human evolution, after our split with chimpanzees about 7 million years ago, almost every single detail of it happens geographically within Africa. And so these grasslands, after those immigration events, are the context for our species evolution. So we'll come back to this. By the way, that is one of the giraffes up there. I know it looks like a moose, but it's not. Okay. So there's the Africa story for the Paleogene and the Neogene, the first of the Southern Islands to join up and become part of like, you know, whatever, the empire, if you want to call it that, <laughs> of the Northern continents. Now let's talk about South America, which is alone for a long time. South America and North America don't start communicating until the very, very, very end of the Neogene, terrestrial ecosystem wise. So here's our endemics in South America way back in the Paleogene. You can see, unlike Africa, South America basically moves west. It doesn't move north or south. That's kind of fun, isn't it? Okay, we have our marsupial lineages, one, two, three of them. We have our monitoring lineage, fun, in the Paleogene. Some of these endemic placental mammals, like the armadillo lineage, the anteater and giant sloth lineage, which is really just a sloth lineage. And again, another one of these paleognath birds, this one's called a rhea, that is endemic to South America. So here's our little baseline based on what we know today. Now I'll show you guys some of the other stuff. Go ahead and talk to your neighbors about pyrotheres and astrapotheres. Do you like them? <laughs> Make a couple quick apps for yourself. Okay. Uh, so sure, but also I do know boy Okay, so what's great about, just give me anything about these two. There's a bunch of species in these two clades, they're both representing their own clades right now. Just what just jumps out to you immediately? Have little trunks. Little tiny trunks. <laughs> they have all the osteological correlates that would let us believe they have some sort of thing here. They have these big old teeth. Some of them are tusks. Some, I think the pirate theory, their top ones are kind of tusks, and I don't think the other ones are tusks and astrapathiers. <laughs> these have no relation to elephants, and actually, we don't think they have any relation to each other either. So I don't know why placental mammals are obsessed with big teeth and trunky noses, but it definitely happens in South America. Another lineage that's extremely important Earth history-wise is this one called Nodo ungulates. These are animals, I'll talk about them later, Do we actually have ones from the Ice Age that are really recent, and we can get DNA from those. And so we know that Nodo ungulates are actually really close relatives of today's like horses, rhinos, tapers. So this is an ungulate radiation that is endemic to South America. So it should go over here with armadillos and aardvarks, but they're extinct, so I can't. <laughs> Nodo ungulates are an endemic ungulate radiation. So ungulates aren't just in the northern continents. It's just that the ones in South America don't live anymore. So I couldn't have shown them to you yet. Weird mammals. Other fun carnivores of the paleogene of South America. Sporacidonts. Sporacidonts are metatherian animals. They are not in the crown group marsupial diversity. So they probably have pouches and all this other stuff. But they are not live in the modern marsupials, so they don't get to be called that. They're called sporacidonts. A lot of the carnivores, small carnivores, medium carnivores, kind of big-ish carnivores, are these marsupials running around. You guys might also remember that those notosuchians, those scary terrestrial crocodiles from dinosaur times, they survive into the Cenozoic only in South America. 
And so throughout the Paleogene, you have these fully running, galloping crocodiles as predators in the jungles and in the grasslands as the grasslands spread. Enjoy that. And then one of these lineages of birds, terror birds, there are two living species of terror birds, they're only in South America, evolve. These are terrestrial animals, they don't fly very much, they are predators themselves. So this, I hope you think, is pretty different than other places. I also want to talk about the fact that there's, again, really strong evidence for rodents and primates to spread. They've already spread from uh, Eurasia into Afro-Arabia, or Africa, we could call it. And then there's another incidence at the end of the Paleogene, when there's both the radiation of rodents and a radiation of primates. You guys know the primates of South America and Central America today, New World monkeys. They are a monophyletic clade that is the descendants of a rafting event, almost certainly, across that relatively narrower Atlantic Ocean. And so things like squirrel monkeys and capuchins and capybaras and guinea pigs and all these other fun South American rodents and monkeys come over from Africa. They're part of this one radiation in Africa and then it's split off onto South America. So these are immigrants. Everybody else has been here for almost the entirety of the Cenozoic and probably were there in the Cretaceous too in terms of their ancestors. Whereas capybaras and squirrel monkeys showed up in the Oligocene, thumbs up. So that's Paleogene South America. Now let's talk about Neogene South America, which is maybe one of my favorite places and times ever. So you can see South America is looking kind of normal. This ocean embayment, this salt, salt water in the Paleogene is gone once we get to about 20 million years ago. South America is looking like itself in a lot of ways. So here we have, still have those clades, of course, living in South America. Here's what some of those uh, ungulate lineages look like. Some of the notoungulates become quite big. You get rhinoceros and horse looking animals that are not rhinoceros and horses. They are these notoungulates, an endemic radiation of ungulates in South America. One of the more extreme members of those radiations are these animals called the top terns, which again might have trunks, even though they're basically very camel like in a lot of their details. Their teeth are extremely not camel like, um, but they look something like this, which I think is pretty cool. The sloths go kind of buck wild in the Neogene. There are several lineages of giant ground sloth. All ground sloths aren't one part of the sloth evolutionary tree. Many members of the sloth evolutionary tree get quite big. Something that you guys might think is interesting is today, when you think of sloths, you think of this, I think, probably you do. And this, there's two species today. Oh, sorry, this one, that one, and that one. Both of these arboreal, sleepy sloth that we have now, they're not each other's closest relative. Both of them are related independently to different giant sloth lineages, and we know that from their DNA. So the two sloths today that look like this are just the relics, because living in the trees ended up working out when the humans came. Isn't that kind of fun? So ground sloths all over the place, only in South America, in the Neogene. Armadillos do some fun stuff. One group of armadillos gets called glyptodonts. These are the ones that get to be about as big as Volkswagens. They've got huge armored shells made out of bone that only armadillos have. Armadillos today still have it. I hope you enjoy his little helmet of armor right there. So these are really fun animals. They get compared very favorably to like armored dinosaurs, those Triassic crocodiles that had armor. There's lots of things that armored vertebrates do again and again. These big glyptodont armadillos do the same thing some of the armored dinosaurs did, which is really cool. Terror birds become really, really intense and scary. The big terror birds are almost all neogene animals. So these are animals that can be about nine feet tall, running around, not flying, only eating like a T-Rex would eat, but they're giant birds. Part of today's radiation of birds too, they're not some ancient bird. And then some of those sporacidons, non-marsupial metatherian mammals evolve some pretty wild morphologies. One of the most famous fossil marsupials is this animal, Phylacus smilus, which is like a saber-toothed marsupial. One way you can tell it apart really easily from a placental saber tooth is that its actual dentary bone has a shelf that is way down. So there's like a sheath that the sabers fit onto. The chin extends down like that. One thing that's really fun about this is that some people in the modern day scientific community think that like Mylas might have actually been not a carnivore at all, maybe even insectivorous. And those would have been like showy, sexy sabers instead of killing sabers. Kind of fun to imagine. It doesn't have a lot of the adaptations. We know that the cats end up evolving when they have big saber teeth to open their mouths really wide. 
kind of fun, pretty weird. Um, enjoy. Is this fun? I would get out of my time machine. Would you get out of your time machine? <laughs> this is a really cool place. Here's the mid-Miocene fauna. These animals can all be found together and they're all drawn to scale. I love this drawing. I just saw it on Twitter and it's good enough for me to put it into my lectures because I love it so much. All I want you to do is take a minute, try to interpret some of this. This is what you're going to see in the mid-Miocene when you get out of your time machine. They're all to scale. It's fun how it's that looks like. That's pretty cool. So show them. And like we get into the patients, we go again here. Today, they're still getting something. Okay, so who do we want to talk about? Argentavis. Argentavis, this one, one of the biggest flying birds of all time, related to condors, which are still an American radiation of like vulture looking birds today. The Andean condor, still alive in South America, currently one of the, he the heaviest flying bird. But Argentavis is quite bigger than that. What else? <laughs> Does everybody love how big this rodent is? This is a capybara relative. So it's a pretty big rodent. What else? Well, the Sacred Marsupial is smaller relative to a lot of the things that I have thought. It's not a big scary monster. The skull is like this when you hold it. Yeah. I can't tell you how much I love this organism. Terrestrial, like Jurassic, Cretaceous, Paleogene, Neogene, lineage of running <laughs> predator crocodiles. I think it's lovely. No part of this animal's ancestry is like pretending to be a log in a river. It's fully Mesozoic and still around in the Neogene of South America. What else? Oh, we talked about a few. I'll take that. Enjoy it. Here's just some really fun sizes to give you some sense of scale. So the biggest terror bird in terms of height is one of these massive ones called Kalenekin, or sorry, Kalenkin. So there's Kalenkin's size. Kalenkin cannot fly, as you might imagine, but it's pretty, pretty, pretty quick. Running around in the grasslands uh, as a predator, as I hope you can imagine. Here's the largest Andean condors today, and here's Argentavis when it comes to wingspan. Comparison for you. Here's how big those giant capybaras were. A lot of the South American mammals are really fun because the people who named them just put people's first and last names together to make a lot of the taxonomy. <laughs> so this giant caffeine part is called Joseph Artigasia. I think it's great. It's not helpful for knowing what things what if you don't already know the names, <laughs> but it works. So there's that giant caffeine bar. And then one of the biggest freshwater turtles of all time is this giant freshwater turtle from South America. And it has a, again, a five-star name, Stupendemis. And means is a popular suffix for turtle names, and this one's pretty stupendous. So here's some South American giants for you: the terror bird, the vault, the condor, the river turtle, the capybara. I want to talk a little bit about South America's geology and its like evolution as a landmass because it's just like beyond beautiful and fantastic. You might know that the mountain systems of South America, the Western Amazon, is some of the most biodiverse land on the planet, and certainly when it comes to things like birds and a lot of other groups. South America's got way more diversity compared to the rest of the world than it has any right to have. And so a lot of that is due to climate alterations and this mountain building that happened in South America. So a ton of biodiversity is there because of the geography. 
And so for almost all of the Mesozoic, South America is part of Pangaea, it's part of Gondwana, it's a low constant. There are not, there's no real good evidence for like any real topography or mountains, like big ranges at any time until we get into the Cenozoic. As South America is moving west, the Pacific Ocean is getting crushed. We're getting this like ring of fire system all over the Pacific, and we start to see building of mountains. Those mountains start in southern South America and propagate up through northern South America. So that a lot of those volcanoes and cool stuff that's happening right now in like Costa Rica, Panama, Colombia, that's all still actively, actively rising, rising, rising. And you guys probably know way down in Patagonia are these crazy ancient mountains. This all is a big Cenozoic mostly thing that happens. All of this biodiversity I'm talking about today in South America is happening in here, what is now the Amazon. But here's what South America looks like. 20, 30, sorry, 33 to 23 million years ago, you have this relatively low-lying continent. That big seaway that was invading all the way into here, the beginning of the Cenozoic, has been draining out as the bottom of the continent's lifted up. It's draining out into the Caribbean. So you have this huge river system going like this, 33 to 23 million years ago. That's the end of the Paleogene. As we go into the Neogene, into the Miocene part of it, what happens is some of that water gets trapped in here and you get, as far as we are able to tell, the largest wetland ecosystem that's ever existed in Earth history. It's called the Pabus Mega Wetland Ecosystem. It is influenced by all the precipitation that's gathering in these mountains and of course, remnants of the seaway that used to be there. I'll talk about that in a second. And what's really cool is, as these mountains keep building up, this is today's Peru, Ecuador, Colombia. As these mountains keep building up, eventually that water stops flowing north and spills over this really low terrain in the middle. And that's when we get the development of what is now the biggest river in the world by a huge amount, which is the Amazon River like this. And so the continental evolution of South America is so fantastic. And so much of the biodiversity we have there is a result of things that happened in this tectonic and geologic past. I like this. People noted this back in the 1800s when like white people were fishing there for the first time. The Amazon is absolutely full. This is vertebrate paleontology after all. The Amazon is absolutely full and some of the best fossils from the Amazon River Basin are of fishes, of these types of fishes, as well as river fishes, as you might expect, which show us all the ways that that deep, deep, deep part of the Amazon used to be connected to the Caribbean to the north. There are saltwater fishes that are now totally freshwater adapted, and they might be the only members of their lineage in the world. There's puffer fish way up in the headwaters of the Amazon River. There's stingrays. You might not know all of these fishes, but I will tell you, for the most part, these are marine organisms. But because of South America's history, you can catch a flounder in like not Oceanside on Peru. I think that's really fun. And so there's all these fun indicators of that past. When it comes to the uh, tetrapods, that mega wetland system is really fun and really interesting. Of course, there's animals like piranhas in that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. This is Purosaurus. Purosaurus is a caiman. You guys might know caiman are these like relatively smaller, one of them's not that small, crocodilians that live in the New World. They live in Central America and South America today. The largest crocodilo more, I'm talking about from the Triassic till now, the largest crocodile morph ever is not from the age of dinosaurs. It is a caiman from the Miocene of South America. So it's not even a crocodile. Isn't that insulting to crocodiles? The biggest crocodile morph of all time is a giant caiman. And so this caiman is awesome. There are a couple really wonderful fossils of giant sloths that quite obviously got eaten by this giant caiman. They got big holes in their femur where it took a bite, which I think is really cool. That mega wetland system has an absolutely insane amount of crocodilian diversity. What you're seeing here is this little caiman relative with a really short pug snout and these globe-shaped teeth, and it's using them to crunch up shells and clams, snails, I'm sorry, snails and clams. There's also fossils of animals like this, the gharial. This is an animal that's only in India today, but in South America, there's plenty of these really long fish, long-snouted fish specialist crocodiles in the Miocene. I will quantify this for you because I just love this paper so, 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 so much. All those fossils are from the Pavis wetland ecosystem, the Miocene of South America. This is just a plot of shape. How wide is your snout? Thin, thick. How long is your snout? Short, long. So do you see these four extremes that crocodiles can have in their snout shape? That gray rectangle is showing you basically the whole evolution of crocodiles ever. 
And then all those colored dots are crocodiles you can find in the Pavis wetland ecosystem. So in the Miocene, in that ecosystem, crocodiles are doing almost everything crocodiles ever did all at one time and all in one place. I know I can talk about birds and mammals all day, but I cannot tell you guys about fish and crocs because there's so much fantastic stuff happening in these places. Does that blow your mind? When this paper came out, I was like, you can tell me the, like the Jurassic and the Cretaceous and the Cenozoic together in this one place in South America is doing all those things because it has so many different kinds of crocs. That's a pretty productive wetland. Okay, so South America then, of course, connects with North America. Africa did it just, just, just under 20 million years ago when it connected with Eurasia. South America starts to maybe start to connect with North America seven-ish million years ago. By six million years ago, there seems to be a terrestrial connection. Panama, as we know it now, doesn't fully form until for sure three million years ago. And so there might be a little bit of island hopping at first. Just like you guys saw in Africa, where you have some animals leave and be quite successful, the other way is what's the more predominant pattern, animals coming into South America. I know I don't have all the time I wish I had. The first northern mammal that we have good fossils of in South America is Chapel, eh, Chapel Melania. It is a bear-sized raccoon that we have good fossils for in South America. I encourage you to look it up because it's pretty cute. But it's a bear-sized raccoon. That's the first we know of, northern immigrant into South America. But this is that pattern, and it's to help explain things that you guys know already. Our porcupines are part of that South American road of radiation. Possums, you already get, I'm sure. Armadillos, you already get, I'm sure. But then things like giant sloths came up and were quite successful. Things like these giant armadillos came up and were quite successful. We find their fossils all over North America. Terror birds also came up. Some of the best terror bird fossils in the world are from Florida. So they came up and like lived all around what's now Texas, Florida, Arizona, and south of what's now the US and all through Mexico. So plenty of these Southern animals made it their way up here. There's also things that aren't on here that I just really love, like hummingbirds. You guys know anything about bird migration? A lot of birds go like this from North America to South America. So that probably starts in this interval of time, which is really beautiful and fun to think about. The animals that go the other way, I hope you see, it's a lot like Africa. Animals you guys might associate with South America today, because of course, as a, as a species, they live there, but their bigger clades are part of this invasion going the other way into South America. Again, with the carnivores, there's dogs and cats in South America now, deer and camels, odd hooked ungulates like tapirs, bunnies, and then some of these elephants, the gomphotheres are the only ones, the gomphotheres, I'll say it again, are the only ones that go into South America. You never get any mammoths or mastodons in South America. It's all gompatheres that survive until the Pleistocene, until the Ice Age in South America. But it's an uneven arrow. These animals are now pretty much a lot of the big mammals of South America. That is not true up here. Possums and porcupines and armadillos are around in North America, but these clades are still most of the big mammal diversity body size wise in North America. That makes sense? This thing is really well studied. It's really fun. The Gabby, the Great American Biotic Interchange, it's been known for a long, 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 long time. And these questions, which you could apply to Africa too, are really, really interesting. What makes the quote unquote Northern animals so much more successful seemingly, and in terms of like duration and what's around right now, it has to be true. And what led the Southern animals that did survive for quite a long time and do quite well to be so successful, whereas other members of the endemic fauna of South America just disappeared. This is very, very cool and very, very interesting. All right, what time is it? Oh yeah, 12.03. Only one left, because Antarctica doesn't have anything to talk about, and that is Australia for now. So let's talk about Australia. Here's Australia 50 million years ago in the Paleogene, and we'll get to Australia in a second in the Neogene. You can see places like New Guinea are underwater for almost all of this time. So Australia's got four of those marsupial lineages that are totally there at the beginning. One, two, three, and four. Two of those big bird lineages, the emu and the cassowary, which are actually each other's closest relative. So that's kind of handy. And then the monotremes are in South America at the beginning, and of course are still there today. So here's our starting point at the beginning of the Cenozoic. What do you guys even think of when you think of animals that are endemic to Australia, but aren't these ones I've already showed you? Talk to your neighbors for a second. What other animals are in Australia that aren't these marsupials and like emus and platypuses? 
Did you walk there? I just replied to someone asking to do that. Yeah, All right, what are we talking about? Reptiles. reptiles, lots of reptiles. What else? You can get specific about reptiles if you want to. Got some weird fish. They still have a lungfish. So yeah, there's still a lungfish. Now, what's fun about that lungfish? I haven't talked about that at all. There's a lungfish in Africa. There's a lungfish in South America. There's a lungfish in Australia. Those actually might be break up a Gondwana fishes, unlike the ostrich, the emu, and the rhea. Those lungfishes might actually have moved with those continents, actually. Okay, so I like the reptiles. When we think about these animals, you guys might not know too many of the fossils yet, of course. But this is the really carnivorous clade that's alive today. It has things like the Tasmanian devil. And then a lot of these are big herbivores. But what else is on the landscape? Of course, it's very reptile-y, except for a few fun details. There actually is an opossum relative in the paleogene of, of Australia. It probably also came from Antarctica. It also doesn't live very long. There's only a handful of fossils of it. But I like that there's also a placental ungulate, one of those noto ungulates. There's a really interesting fragmentary fossil that people think might be a noto ungulate at the very beginning of the paleogene in Australia. So two of these mammal lineages that have nothing to do with it anymore. Somebody's hanging around, just like there's a platypus in Australia, or sorry, in South America for a second. I think that's kind of fun. But otherwise, it's a lot of reptiles. A lot of these mid-tier predator gills are filled by reptiles, which is fun. Varanid lizards, aka monitor lizards, are really important terrestrial predators in Australia and all through like Southeast Asia. They're really interesting. The Australians call them goannas. Anybody ever see rescuers down under? Maybe. It's pretty old now. Okay. Well, the lizard's name is Joanna because Goanna, and I always think that's fun. <laughs> Crocodiles are a big part of Australia's history. Uh, there are some terrestrial crocs that we'll talk about later, but they're a big part of Australia. And then I think I heard somebody out there say it a second ago. There's a whole lot of snakes in Australia. And again, this is probably a fluke of geography. There's a whole adaptive radiation of snakes that's specific to Australia. Almost all of them are part of the clade that is the cobra clade. So that's why Australia's like snakes are so, 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 so scary and joke about all the time because they tend to be extremely venomous. All the other continents have snake radiations in this other group, the colubrids, which is like racers and garters and rat snakes and stuff, not really venomous at all. But Australia's radiation is Mostly venomous. I think that's funny. Who are the only placental mammals? I'm not talking about seals and sea lions and whales. Who are the only placental mammals probably in the paleogene? Besides this one. That only lasts for a second. Bats. Bats. Because they can fly there. Anybody read Stella Luna? Stella Luna is a little kid story about a big old Australian fruit bat. Well, yeah, a lot of bats throughout Australia's history because those placentals can get there on their own. And that's really fun. So here's Australia in the paleogene. This is modern snapshots to give you an idea of what the diversity might have looked like. There's no fossils really on here except for these two indicating fossils. Because Australia doesn't really have a very good paleogene fossil record. Australia is a very flat continent. There's not a lot of sedimentation. There's not a lot of fossils getting made. So Australia's kind of got some stuff that it bums me out. But let's talk about the neogene when stuff's really fun. And we do have a lot of really good fossils. So this is some really excellent neogene paleo art. Here's all your members that are still around. And here's a nice mural from the museum in Queensland, I'm almost certain. Uh, talk to your neighbors. Who's in this mural? What's going on? Who do you recognize? Well, a short-faced kangaroo. Yeah, a long the large yeah. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I think uh, the crow. Some of the guys in the home. Or just a lot of girls sometimes. That's it. Shut up, girls. Eating the tackle. 
All right, who are we recognizing up here? Or we think we might be recognizing? It's like a wombat. This is a great big wombat. So wombats are uh, in this clade diprotodons. That's where also koalas are and kangaroos are and like sugar gliders are. But this is a great big wombat, like hippo-sized wombat. So again, think about these patterns of like on each island ecosystem, there's mammals that are gonna fill really similar niche spaces to others. So you've got rhinos on one continent, hippos on another continent, and those notoungulates in South America, and these giant wombats in Australia. They're all these big lumbering red, or sorry, herbivores of a really similar body mass. That's really cool. So you got a big wombat, look at that nose. What else? Thylacines, the Tasmanian tiger, as you guys might know, this animal only went extinct 100 years ago or so in Tasmania, but it was on mainland. The thylacine looks a whole lot like a dog, which is spectacular because it's a marsupial. So another example of that convergent evolution, that filling of niche space, these little carnivorous marsupials, looking very canine-like, but they are not. What else? The kangaroo, there's certainly plenty of kangaroos and wallabies today and wallaroos. But this is a really big kangaroo called the stilt leg kangaroo. It has a very short face, very long legs and huge feet. That foot has one single gigantic toe, one gigantic toe. Some of these guys are about 10 feet tall and the biggest of them were thought to be too big to do any kind of like hopping like you see a kangaroo do today. They are thought to have like walked on their toes. The reconstructions of it are really spectacular. These animals are often compared very favorably to giant ground sloths and other animals that would sit back and like bring vegetation to their mouths with big long arms. Actually, Therizinus or dinosaurs too. So really fun, interesting browsing kangaroos. What else? Yes, we've got a little crow, which is related to the birds today, of course. These are cockatoos. There's all, Australians do a great job with their names, right? Larky, cockatoo, koala, kangaroo. <laughs> it's all very good stuff. Mostly Aboriginal words, of course. Uh, you got your giant lizard. We'll talk about that in a second. This thing, which no one said anything about, fine. Uh, and then this one, which is my favorite. This is called Thylacoleo. That is a carnivorous koala. It is often called the marsupial lion, but it is a koala relative. Huge claws, very sharp teeth, convergently like the teeth of cats and dogs in that they have a blade, molar, premolar situation happening. So this is one of your terrestrial carnivores in Australia, uh, a really intense koala. So there's some stuff there. Thylacoleo is the koala lion, that protodon. Uh, this is a duck, by the way. It's not one of the other relatives. It's called Remormus, also huge. Uh, and then this is fun. Megalania is this giant monitor lizard. It is, as far as we can tell, the biggest terrestrial lizard in all of Earth history. So think about all these big things. The biggest snake ever, uh, Paleogene, South America. The biggest croc ever, Neogene, South America. The biggest terrestrial lizard ever, Australia, Neogene, and Pleistocene. So a lot of these reptile lineages are hitting their maxes outside of like dinosaur age of reptile time. I think that's fun. Thylacoleo is one of my favorite animals in the world. It is one of the only examples anybody can find of a clade of tetrapods that became herbivores. And the whole radiation is herbivorous, wombats, kangaroos. And then this is a secondarily derived from an herbivore clade, obligate carnivore. Really fun. Just for fun, I want to show you where some of these things have been popping out. So here's our Laurasia theater diversity that you guys already have seen with a little more detail up top. So here's where your notoungulates go. Here's where those creodons go. And then here's your apotheres, where those weirdos go, and where we think maybe these two go, which is really upsetting because nobody can tell. But OK, that's all I have for you today. And on Monday, we are meeting here at 2.30, and we're doing nine presentations. I've got a plan, don't worry. But it's going to be awesome. All right. I will see you guys then.